Always great being on with you, Annie. In your forward to this issue, you get straight into it by announcing how you'll spell out how America has become a fully-fledged police state. You're calling it a trend to fascism. Can you explain what's led you to make that statement? Yes, and, and this isn't rhetoric and it's not hyperbole. It's based on fact. And the first fact was that on New Year's Eve, when no one was paying attention, uh, President Obama signed into law the National Defense Authorization Act. And included in this act is the ability of the president of Los Estados Unidos. They say that because America is turning into a banana republic. He can declare anyone an enemy or a belligerent of the state. No judge... No jury, no trial, no charges, no writs of habeas corpus. You're taken away by the military, tortured, killed, never to be heard from again. No lawyers, no nothing. And this this didn't make the news at all in the mainstream news. And also included in that act was repeal of what was called the Passe Comitatus Act of 1878 which prohibited the military from performing police duties. Now they can, and now they are. What reason has been given for the American government to take this step? What have they told the population? Oh, it's terrorism, terrorism. We got Al-Qaeda out there. You're not safe. America's a battlefield. I'm not making that up. Go on, Google it up. Put in Lindsey Graham, that cracker from South Carolina, the senator, one of the gang of 535. That's right, there are 535 senators and congressmen that tell 312 Americans how to tie their shoes. Listen to him on the Senate floor, calling it a battlefield. And guess what? If we think you're a terrorist, Lindsey says... You don't get no trial. You don't get no jury. That's right. That's America. So and put a K in that when you spell it. How great has the opposition been to this law? None. It passed 97 to 3 out of 100 senators. It's incredible There's stuff. No difference between the Republicans and the Democrats. It's a syndicate. You will... Then Obama, uh, in February, signs an executive order. Yeah, that's right. Backtrack Barack. You know, the guy that was shooting his fat mouth off when George Bush was signing them and when he was running for president of Los Estados Unidos, he said that he would never do that. Well, guess what he can do now? He could sign an executive order under, quote, a potential potential threat, you know, from them Al-Qaeda's out there. And he could call martial law. He could take over the banks, take over the factories and the farms, put the police out and bring the military in. That didn't even make the news. It's incredible stuff. You talk also in your forward about the fact that we are moving towards the first great war of the 21st century, that this is what the future holds. And unless enough people wake up, face the facts and change its course, that we're in for uh, you know a pretty hellish time. You believe the drumbeat for war is getting louder. Who wants it, Gerald Salente? Who are they targeting and why? First of all, let's look around the world. We just had May Day. Look at, all the, look at all the demonstrations that went around in France and Italy, in Spain and Portugal and Ireland, all over, the, all over Europe, all over most of the world. The gap between the rich and the poor is the widest that it's ever been. This is class warfare. When the money stops flowing down to the man on the street, the blood starts flowing in the streets. They call these austerity measures. Isn't that a proper fine word to take the money from the people and give it to the banks that made bad bets? You're seeing the wars in Syria. You're seeing it in Yemen, in Bahrain, in Egypt, in Tunisia. How many more do people have to add up before it hits them in the head? And then you see what's going on with Israel and Iran. And we wrote this Trends Journal, by the way, before we heard the former prime minister of Israel, Ehud 
uh, uh, Omer, Omer, before we heard the uh, defense secretary, former uh, defense secretary of Israel, before we heard the former intelligence chief of Israel, all say that the current administration of Netanyahu and Ehud Barak, the defense minister over there, they, they said that these people were messianic. And, that, and, that, and, and they're saying it, it's the stupidest things they've ever heard coming out of their mouths. Now, I'm not, this is what we said in the Trends Journal, and then two weeks later, we hear four of Israel's top former officials repeating verbatim what we were writing in the Trends Journal. We have psychopaths leading us to war. I just got back from Berlin, and I, I can't get it out of my mind as I saw these beautiful buildings, and I, you know, I travel the world, and to me, when I look at Berlin, I could imagine it having been grander than Paris before World War II. And then you see all where the bombed out buildings were and the new construction in between the old ones. Yeah. And I said to myself, these are the Germans. These are intelligent people. You know, they, 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 they do, they, you know, these are people of high culture, high class. How could they have let a two bit freak, a two bit freak like Adolf Hitler? lead them into destruction. And you know what? Every country I look at, they have two-bit freaks leading their countries. The one you have over there in Australia, Gallard, Sarkozy, the American. You had Berlusconi, a bad knockoff of Mussolini. We have Obama, Bush, one after another, telling the entire population what they should do, how they should do it, and how they should obey. You're urging us all to think about why we allow our leaders to know what's best for us, to tell us what's best for us. But I'm certainly noticing that, if anything, Gerald Salente, Australians seem to be losing faith in the political system and disengaging from the process at a rapid rate. We've just had local government elections here and voting participation was down to 50%. And we've got compulsory voting in Australia, as you know. Well, again, you know, why should you vote for a lesser of two evils? What self-respecting person, hey, Annie, would you hang around with a lesser of two evils? Would you have a partner that's a lesser of two evils? Would you, would you do business with a lesser of two evils? But yet people will vote for a lesser of two evils to control their lives. And again, I mean, I cannot think of a better, better example than the destruction of Germany by, again, a two-bit freak. I mean, if there was ever a freak show, it had to be Adolf Hitler and, and Benito Mussolini. And look what they did. I love the fact that you talk about why we should all keep an eye out for any announcements made by our governments on a Friday. Working in the media, it's certainly something that I've noticed firsthand. But can you explain a little more? Yes, I mentioned that President Obama, for example signed the uh, National Defense Authorization Act on New Year's Eve. Who is listening to the news on New Year's Eve? Virtually no one. Well, they do the same thing on Fridays. They release information that they're compelled to release when the media leaves the state houses or the Capitol for the weekend. And then Saturday is the least read newspaper and least read followed news day of the week. So the news comes out and everybody misses it. I mentioned Obama's signing the, uh, the executive order. He did it at 7 o'clock on a Friday night. Oh, here's another one for you. Big bro, our attorney general over here, because this is out, out big brothering Orwell, he just, he just passed new guidelines. They're listening into what I'm saying right now. That's right. They watch every stroke of my keyboard. They listen to every cell phone. They pick you up on surveillance. And, they're, and now they're building algorithms to find out whether or not you are a potential threat to the state. How concerned, I'm not making this up. How concerned are you then about your own safety given the new legislation there in America? Well, you know, I am concerned. And, I, and I've been thinking about leaving. And then I said the other day, I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving. If Obama, Romney, Santorum, Gingrich, or one of these guys wants me to leave, let them come and tell me to leave. Or they don't have the manhood to do it, and they'll send flunkies to do it. 
If they want me to leave, let them come and tell me to leave. And I'm sick and tired of these people telling me, well, you know, if you don't like it, you should leave. No, you should leave. You're the ones that are raping the Constitution. I'm staying. Am I going to risk my life? No. If I get threatened, if I get, you know, shot at, uh, yeah, of course I'll leave. But up until that point, I'm staying. I sent you an interesting link yesterday about some developments that have happened in Iceland recently in terms of the financial system there and the everyday person's mortgage. And uh, the article points out that there'd been a complete media blackout about the reporting of this story. Can you just encapsulate the story for us and, and why you believe we haven't heard about it until, well, I hadn't heard about it until yesterday? Well, we've been writing about Iceland for a long time. Everybody maybe remember they were the first ones really hit by the financial panic, the meltdown. What happened was people were putting money in Icelandic banks and getting high returns on interest rates. The banks were leveraging out the money, and they had a building boom like everywhere else when it busted. It was particularly the Danish and the English. They demanded that the Icelandic people pay back the loans and uh, the losses, rather, that they took when the banks went bankrupt. And the people, they voted. The people said, no, we're not going to do it. You made a bad bet, you lose. Now, what are they doing in Ireland? What are they doing in Spain? What are they doing in Italy? What are they doing in Greece? What are they doing throughout Europe? They're forcing the people through austerity measures to pay back the bad bets that banks made under the guise that by raising taxes, cutting benefits, cutting pensions, cutting services and costing more to live on everything, that that will somehow reinstate economic growth when, in fact, all it does is bail out the bankers. Well, the people in Iceland said, no, we're not going to do it. And then what did they do? They forgave the debt of the people who were losing their houses and suffering under the bad policies that the banks took. And they were also bringing those people up on charges in the banks, the prime minister the, and, and politicians that were complicit in this fraud. Now, that's an example to me of direct democracy, where the people understand that they have the voice and they have the power, not two-bit politicians. And by the way, if anybody wants to really... I used to be the assistant, by the way, to the secretary of the New York State Senate. One of our writers in the Trends Journal, Dr. Paul Craig Roberts, the former assistant treasury secretary under Ronald Reagan. A number of us have been around. We know what it looks like. We know who these people are. And for those of you who don't know who they are, go back to high school and college and try to remember who the people were that wanted to be class president and head of the student council. You know, the people you couldn't stand, the suck-ups, the brown noses, the glad-handers, the overly ambitious. Are you saying there's no good people in politics, though? There are very, very few. Is there any good people in the Bananos and the, and, and the, and the uh, Gambino crime family? It's a crime family. It's a syndicate. And you obey orders. You leave. The only way you get to the top is sucking your way up to the top. So, Gerald Salente, um, amongst all this negative talk, what is the glimmer of hope for everyday Australians listening right now who kind of go, well, look, I'm really disenchanted with the political system here. Well, how do we re-engage? Re-engage, I believe, is, again, pick a page out of what, what they did in Iceland and what they've done in Switzerland. Direct democracy. Let the people vote. Start movements to let the people vote on every major issue. Oh, you want troops? You want American troops on your soil? Let the people vote. You want to raise taxes on it? Let the people vote. Do you want to send more troops to Afghanistan as Obama was – you just had your uh, – uh, the U.S. – uh, national security people, defense industry, meeting with you, your prime minister. That's right. And they're, they're on board for 10 more years in Afghanistan. Let the people vote. Let the people vote. And I believe direct democracy is the only way out. The political systems are corrupt from top to bottom. Name the com- country. From Nigeria, from Walmart buying off, you know, uh, 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 politicians in Mexico, in the United States, it's corrupt. It's the system. The system breeds corruption. Again, look at Switzerland. Nice place to visit. Food is good. Everybody has guns. They don't kill each other. High standard of living. The people vote. 
Well, Gerald Salente, I could talk to you all day about uh, a number of uh, topics that I'm sure you'd have plenty to say on Labor Day celebrations this coming Monday in Australia. So it'll be very interesting to see how that unfolds here. Great to catch up with you again and thanks for your time. Always great being on with you. Thanks.